Okay, so attention, please. Um, attention, please. Attention, please. <laughs> Now it's the last discussion panel for today and for the whole conference. I, we, Alex and me, we welcome you um, to this very interesting topic that we were going to discuss with this very great um, expert panelist here. And um, the topic is, as you know, um, will AI replace medical doctors? And I personally am very looking forward to it and I'm very excited because in 60 minutes, I will know whether I have to look out for a new job in this evening. <laughs> so let's start with a little introduction. Um, maybe we start with Oliver Rong. Oliver Rong is a senior partner at um, Roland Berger. Um, and he has extensive healthcare knowledge with a focus on providers such as hospitals, um, nursing homes, or also outpatient care. And um, also focuses on strategy and process re reorganization. Yeah, then we have uh, Dr. Henriette Neumeyer. Uh, she's a senior clinical consultant at Philips uh, Public Health Management and she has a medical background, so she's a doctor as well and used to work in um, uh, jaw, uh, mouth surgery. Mund, Kiefer, Gesicht, Chirurg. So sitting next to Henriette is um, Francisco Riveros Escobar, when I'm pronouncing it rightly, okay. Um, he has a background as computer scientist and is now working as cognitive technical lead at IBM, where he um, is an innovator of, or acts, an in, as, acts as an innovator of computer applications and developer of new technologies. And then we have Sven Mack. He's a postdoctoral scientist at uh, the Department of Informatics at, from the University of Hamburg for human robot interaction. So maybe we can put our hands together for a warm applause for this nice panelist. Okay, so I think we're all on the same page when talking about AI that we know that it is going to transform or is already transforming our, our daily life and also, of course, healthcare is no exception. And um, I think talking about health or the healthcare system is a quite emotional topic because there are very life-changing um, decisions that are made there. And um, always when we talk about AI or machine and robotics and digitalization in general, um, there comes up hype on the one side, but also fears, especially um, when we think of uh, that jobs may be loosened or that someone can lose their jobs and AI can take over them. And in fact, when we look at um, the medicine, at the healthcare system, um, in areas such as radiology or cancer detection, um, it is already here in place. And um, I think um, it is ready to become even more present uh, in, in, in industry. And I think Alex and me were both from the medical side. So he, he, Alex um, worked as a doctor before he went to Philips and uh, looking for new challenges. And I think um, when we talk about the work of doctors, we have like three essential parts. So I think one is the diagnostic part. We have to look what kind of disease the patient has, what does he have. And the second one is we have to set up a therapy plan. And the third one is to um, tell the patients how the prognosis is. And when we talk about those three essential parts of medicine, of doctor's work, then I think there's uh, AI is gradually, gradually taking over already. Um, in uh, systems where they employ like deep learning, machine learning, also natural language um, processings. And um, just to start the conversation here, um, I'd like to quote one important person in this field. And um, this is Professor Geoffrey Hinton, who is uh, also called the godfather in neural networking. And um, he said, it's quite obvious that we should stop training radiologists as image perception algorithms are very soon going to be demonstrated better than humans. Radiologists are, he says, the coyote already over the edge of the cliff who hasn't yet looked down. 
And another very important Silicon Valley investor, Weinert Kostler, even goes one step further by saying, radiologists practicing in 10 years will cause death. So a very hard statement here. Um, maybe I will hand over to the panelists. Um, Henriette, what do you think? Can, do I have to, would you recommend me like writing, start writing application today evening or do I, can I go to my tennis class tonight? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, we had some discussions on that topic in a previous panel today about disruption in healthcare. And um, can you hear me? Or, yeah? Okay. Well, um, what was really interesting there was how do we creatively work with the results that INI uh, presents us? And as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of AI today is machine learning based on retrospective data sets. So it's not in itself imminent that it can be creative, that it can kick off the next discussion, if not programmed so, and it just uses categories it has been trained for. And I think we will need even more advanced profiles in medicine and for doctors and also for nurses in their science um, to take that data and to take that things that just don't fit so much in the results of AI and put them into intelligent resource, uh, research. And if we go to that point where we can use data properly, we probably have to have a profile that uh, is data-driven, knows how the processes in the AI work and how that algorithms work, maybe has basic understanding of programming such, so he can put in the right requirements and the right human kind of ideas, disruptive idea, to work with that results that we get from there. So I think it would even rise um, the sophistication of that job profile. So I think you, you should not go to tennis, but to train for how to, you will use AI in the future, so you won't get obsolete. And we will need uh, the human factor in it for innovation, for ideation, to um, drive further how that technology can erase things that we did before by ourselves. That's true, but to do it so intelligent that it gets more use out of it than a good diagnosis. Oliver, please. Can I just add something? Um, I, I mean, it's always essential to think from which perspective we answer that question. If you, there's in Germany a saying, if you ask the frogs when you want to dry out the pond, uh, then you get some answers. So uh, when you ask, for example, for the radiologist association, they will not see that the number of radiologists is going to be reduced. Um, why is that? Because not only because they say that uh, AI as a diagnostics support, uh, you talked about that already, uh, will make uh, his or her way through. But the other thing is that uh, the work of the radiologist might be more interventional. Yeah, so, so the job uh, description might change due to the fact that some things uh, might disappear and others are going to rise. So um, my point of view here would be that, and that's always the case, we might have difficulties to predict the future if we would think ourselves 10 years ahead and look then back it might be a different picture. So, so um, maybe the, the investor perspective is right, but on the other hand, I think uh, it depends very much on the people in the system, how fast technologies come into the place. Uh, that's uh, very essential. And the second point would be, um, I mean, when, when, it, when it's really the case that the accuracy of diagnostics by a machine learned and trained system is better, then we, would, uh, then we need to do that. We cannot afford us to keep the patients out of the best solutions. I mean, that's, that's of course a fact, and that is something we have to have in mind, I think. Yeah, um, what, what do you think? I mean, uh, Sven, because um, you, you are studying human-robotic interaction. Do you think radiologists might use robots in the future for interventions? What do you think? Well, maybe not radiologists, because they work with visual data mostly, so they don't need a robot. In the system itself can work on a computer as well, but I agree with both of you that the radiologist doesn't lose his job. Um, I still want him to use the steep neural network because it might be, be quite often it already is better in recognizing things in a vision, uh, from a vision perspective, but interpreting what that means 
is not up to the machine and it can't be done by the machine yet um, and not for a long time, I guess. Um, so I think looking at the result from the uh, machine and then interpreting those results correctly, that's still the job of the radiologist. Understanding where the shortcomings are of the machine, there I completely agree, is also part of the radiologist. So we need doctors who actually know about AI and what the system is capable of and where the shortcomings are. It's only as good as the data is that we provide in the end. So in robotics, I think um, there we are talking about other areas. I mean, we already have robots in medicine, uh, so far mostly remote controlled, um, not autonomous as far as I know. <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong, I might have missed one. But um, there I, again, want them supported. Uh, if the machine can close the wound better than a um, quite overworked doctor can do it, uh, I mean, most doctors are a little bit overworked at least, or after a long uh, three-hour operation, just closing the wound might be something you don't want to do. If the machine can do that perfectly, of course, uh, that's a job of the machine can be done. But most of the jobs are not up to the machine, uh, where you need quick thinking, ingenuity, maybe cases that have never appeared before. The machine could have never learned this and doesn't have the capability to actually react with new actions that it never learned. So in this case, a robot might come in, but again, only as a supporter or maybe semi-autonomous in an operation. So are you saying that abstract, uh, abstract thinking is like one of the limits right now of uh, AI and robotics? It's very difficult to define um, what exactly is abstract thinking. Um, Coming up an, with new ideas, for an, an example, for example, was uh, the Go Championship. Everybody might have read about um, we have been beaten in Go by now. Um, the grandmasters have been beaten and they actually said the machine showed creativity in its moves. So that it actually played moves that no grandmaster has ever played before, apparently, they said. I don't know Go that much, but they said there were new moves. Why was that? Because the machine played against itself and found out that it's a valid solution. Uh, just because the humans never used it for some reason, well, the machine found it and is that now creativity? If yes, I would say, well, then the machine can also do what we often call abstract thinking. Uh, just because it had some cases where it, within its training where this appeared and it found a solution. Well, what is creativity for us? Uh, um, Francesco, you're working with the Watson from IBM. So what do you think should, uh, are the current limitations of AI? Um, so for current limitations, I think uh, we need to think, uh, uh, I mean, just to rephrase or, or just to take back the, the what, what uh, here the panelists said, um, is that we, um, as a, uh, I mean, uh, as an implementer for AI, we need to take care about the what data we are using and, and how this data is, is going to represent something to help the doctors in the say in, in in one sense, so we need to think that AI could uh, work as a supporter, as a helper. But uh, from my perspective, uh, the limitations that we have right now is that um, uh, we need we don't need to think that AI will uh, fix or or will find the problem right uh, straight away with the exactitude uh, accuracy that a doctor can do with experience uh, about uh, along the years and all the other I know, types of treatment or type of knowledge that they, they, the doctors set, uh, have in, in the mind. So there is a lot of things that um, the machine yet cannot do. That there is a lot, a lot of bias in, inside of the algorithm that we implement in terms of the data, of the, the med medicine data, that uh, I think is a better um, it's a better than it's a supporter than, than more than um, a, a solution giver for for, for the doctor. So uh, right now, for me, so the limitation is not uh, it's, it's just about how um, yeah the, the bias in the data that we are using and um, yeah this helper is more more a helper for the doctor than than give the solution straight away. 
Someone wants to add something? Oliver? I just wanted to give the microphone back, but I can add something <laughs> as well. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I mean um, uh, the accuracy of data, of course, is one limitation for developing those uh, machine learning alg algorithms. Just one personal experience. I had the opportunity not only to work for Roland Berger, but spent three days at the Sclepus Clinic uh, and did their China business development. So I know China a bit. Uh, so what, what is happening in China, and that's completely different from what we uh, do in Europe and maybe in other Western-oriented countries, they just do it. And uh, I talked to some scientists from, from Essen, which are also radiologists. They say we in Europe might have a chance for two years to have a with a better database, better algorithms, uh, but if we don't do that, the Chinese will come over and will bring in their solutions based on um, their, their algorithms. And that is another point. Uh, again, uh, if we talk about such a topic, we have to, uh, we, we need to have a kind of perspective, and my perspective is a patient's perspective. Again, if I would get a better outcome by using technology, I would want us to do that. Yeah? depending on the question which people are around, uh, which, which, uh, who, who may, maybe might change something. Uh, when, you, when you think of, from a patient's perspective, then you have to go for the technology. Um, that's a really interesting point. And what do you think about a diagnosis? Like, um, I mean, there, there are certain diagnoses by AI that a human cannot really understand. So what would you say if your algorithm gives you a diagnosis and no human could actually uh, understand why it, uh, it is giving you that. So how would you handle that? I mean, I mean, there will, from my point of view, always kind of interface between a machine that diagnoses something and currently uh, a human interface that explains to the patient what is currently diagnosed. That is something I, will, I, will, uh, I do see. But on the other hand, um, and we talked about doctors county, I would, would go one step further. When we see some AI solutions, think of ADA. Then it starts even earlier. You ask the, uh, the, the computer questions, or the computer asks questions, and you answer those questions, and then you find out what, what kind of diagnosis, uh, diagnosis or illness you might have. So it's not only in the field of radiology, uh, when it comes to, let's call it, hardcore diagnosis, but it's in, also in the field of, uh, I would call it, a soft diagnosis, where you have some problem, and you just ask the machine, or the machine asks questions uh, that help you to understand the problem and gives you a kind of guidance of what diagnosis it might, that might be behind. That is also very interesting. And that will also change dramatically another point. The patient is getting more informed today. And that is something also for doctors, because typically in the older pages or, or times, they were the guys, guys uh, namely, uh, with the white robes. Uh, uh, everyone uh, saw them as gods and white, huh? but that is changing. So the patient is coming on eye level. He can discuss with, with those people, and I, um, I'm sure that for a certain time, maybe, of course, we need, of course, a human interface that maybe not only sees the radiologist, uh, or the radiology part of, of a diagnosis, but there is much more behind. Think of MS, for example. My brother had that problem. He went, went to an eye doctor, and the eye doctor just told him, you have MS. So, and, uh, he was left alone, yeah, no, no psy psychological treatment or support, and I think that is something that will stay for a certain time. Yeah, um, what I would like to add to that uh, is um, thinking about what ca AI can do for us is maybe, I mean, you're working with it deep dive every day um, to challenge what we do in medicine. So it might not erase an entire profession, but it could erase some bad ways of thinking things through. So if we could identify patterns on how we behave, on how we diagnose, and how biased we are doing that, I think that would be a huge asset. I mean, bad data sets, that's what you were talking about, is doing the wrong things afterwards, but that belongs to some certain process that has occurred before. So when we come into a, a level where we can challenge the way we do medicine through seeing what AI does wrong, looking at it and understanding that it was our fault in the initial data set of our behaviors, I think that could be a huge asset from AI, from my perspective. Yeah. So, yeah, so as, I, as, I, as I said, this, this is going to be more a supporter 
<clears throat> and uh, just be coming back to the, the data point, for example, we had a, a, a solution um, times ago uh, from Watson Health, which was uh, trained uh, completely with data of Americans. And uh, we wanted to to um, use that uh, software or a model in, in in Europe, but we had the problem that the, that model didn't work because it's, it was made by um, data for for Americans and not for mod model for uh, for Europeans. And then we started to get, um, we say, okay, we are going to feed the model with uh, European data. But then we came with the problem of GDPR and, and privacy and on, on, on data. And, uh, and we said, <clears throat> okay, then maybe we need, like, I think to fill up all the model, we need five years in total to get this. And it was incredible. So we couldn't do it because we didn't have a, like such an amount of data anonymized to create this kind of solutions right now. Uh, because of the limitations that we have only, uh, for example, in Europe. Um, so that is only one point that I wanted to mention. Uh, but in terms of uh, what, what, what you said, is, is, is really important and I think it's, it would be a huge asset because in terms of using a doctor using AI, will uh, give the doctor more time to be with the patient and not with uh, filling uh, computer, uh, the computer record of all how is the patient goes, how, uh, what is the call the questions and so on. So I think uh, I remember that one, uh, one image of one, one person, um, I mean one child um, was, uh, they say, okay, draw your pediatrician. And she draw the pediatrician just in front of the computer and she beside. So that is the image that the child has for, for a pediatrician, for a doctor. She is always, always with the computer. So we need to uh, find out a way where we can create software to help uh, the, um, the doctors to give a better outcome, a better result, uh, but to have more time with the patient, to have more time with them, a quality time, which is uh, the best in this case. Just want to add to the point of the explainability. I mean, that's currently, I think, the problem of the whole neural network field is we can never explain what is going on and why. Uh, we have huge complex models that do their job almost perfectly, but yeah, you can't actually question them. They just tell you an answer and you can't ask, why did you give me this answer? And that is a problem that I think not only the medical um, part of AI has. It's like autonomous driving. Why did you drive over that woman currently? Uh, um, th that's definitely something that people would like to know. In America, that case was clearly listed. The question was, why did it do it? Uh, who is to blame? And uh, I think that is one of the problems, uh, the, the most prominent one currently for the whole field, to actually have algorithms that, in the end, I can actually either directly question, why did you say this? And then the algorithm tells me, well, because these few data points pointed to this, um, because of this one case, and so on. Only then can we actually question as well. Like a doctor, I completely agree. If the system tells me something wrong and I can say, why did you arrive at this conclusion and then can discuss with that system, that would be incredibly helpful in most cases, I guess. Yeah. You know what's funny about that? Not knowing how it does that and maybe it works out or it doesn't. That's a basic principle in medicine. Like uh, there's a German uh, uh, Idiom to that, wer heilt hat recht, that means who cures the patient is in the right place of his doing. So, um, I mean, that's a funny thing, that uncertainty thing and that we don't know exactly what's going on, but we see it works. That's so medical, so it might be the perfect match between AI and a discipline um, that could be medicine in which it would work out because people are used to working with that kind of uncertainty. And one point to what you were saying, that's absolutely right. We are sitting in front of computers documenting. In Germany, there has been a, uh, a research from the Marburger Bund, which is a, um, uh, how do you say that, a union for, um, for physicians in Germany. And uh, they found out that more than 30% of the doctors each day spend more than three hours a day in documentation. So, I mean, it's an unsexy topic. If you talk about AI replacing medicals, then I have to ask the questions. Maybe we are all 
we could have a, a much more valuable medicine if we would erase that idea tasks out of our daily business and medicine and make the AI work for that automatic coding and documentation stuff so I'm hands-free with my patients. And that's important because we know there's research that touch, human touch, can improve and accelerate the, um, the, the medication efficiency in the patient. For example, pain meds, we know that. So it's essential that people touch other people within the health care experience, maybe not for all types and maybe not in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern where there is a huge distance to touch uh, people because they're just far away and not so, so mobile to get to, uh, to the next facility that is far away. But I think that way, the unsexy way, <laughs> actually, maybe we could create a space in uh, such way that the physicians can adapt that technology for the medical purposes properly and get that data managers they need to be to improve future health experience. Yeah, so, so another point that uh, I mean, just to, to give in, in this in this round, I mean, to to um, get deep in the, that concept, is that for example, AI can can help you uh, to get uh, get further or or predict some 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 kind of things. Like, for example, if you if you are in the hospital in the urgency in AR, and uh, and you see an AI predicts that in this day uh, the pollution, the air pollution, is going to raise because of, uh, uh, for example, there is a huge fire in um, in California. Let's say uh, there is a huge fire, so the air pollution will be uh, really high. So the people with asthma will uh, start to get more sweating uh, and start to get and, and 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 you are going to have in ar the the alert that please be aware that the most most people will come with asthma uh, attacks for example and so that will give you more chance uh, as a doctor or as a as a team ar team to be more prepared uh, to have maybe more um, beds, uh, I don't know how they they, are, they treat you treat asthma, but uh, or have more more staff uh, to do that, you know. So these kind of things they can be done, they can be done, and and it can now be done. So it's kind of like uh, using the, we we don't have to think like um, that the AI will solve the problem also of be like a medical like in the, in the, in the movies uh, but right now we can do this kind of stuff that can make the doctor's life uh, even better. Yes. Just a very tiny bit to that. <laughs> Just a tiny bit to that asthma thing because we're working so much with patient engagement I mean, why wait until they get to the ER? If we, for example, know that they could increase their asthma medication at that point, so they don't get into the status, which is dangerous and puts them at risk of dying, essentially, so, or further complications. So maybe we can roll out then via healthcare application on site. That's how you can prepare for the day. You are at risk of suffering from your asthma more mm -hmm. today. So that could be one thing to use it. Noted. <laughs> Just, just want to add uh, to, to the, what, what we are saying. I mean, we're talking from a doctor's perspective, but what uh, we have to say is that the nurses will also have the same uh, topic when it comes to documentation. So it's not only doctors which will maybe profit, but other, um, other staff groups as well. Another point is we talk about not only diagnostics, but also prediction. Yeah, that's what, what you are saying. When you talk about the ER topic or, or, or other things, we might be able to predict things and that is something that will also help us as patients or not only patients but consumers to predict how our life could be in terms of a kind of lifestyle. I think it's also something where AI can, can, can do a lot and creates a different interface when it comes then to a patient, doctor, consumer, doctor um, 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 yeah, um, interface. Sorry. The problem that I'm seeing right now to do this kind of stuff is that uh, we, we, we have data everywhere. I have here, I have in your cell phone, you have uh, in every, every part of, I mean, you, 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 lose, you use your data, you have everything like health, uh, I know, like uh, heart rate and so on. So uh, why, I mean, the problem that we have now is how we can integrate all this data that you have uh, 
in order to integrate also with other kind of uh, systems internally to give to the doctor when you sit with the doctor and the doctor will automatically see all your data beside with your with your watch with your cell phone with anything related with your, your where you live etc so why we don't have these kind of things right now so this is a kind of a problem i mean right now i think it's for for kind of uh, limitation and, and data privacy and so on but it could be good it could be great if we are in a in, in a communicated world where when you go to the doctor the doctor had everything as a 360 view uh, of, of, of you, then how, how, you, how you can treat you well. In this Let, let's let's uh, take, take a look five years ahead. I mean, the data privacy problem is an issue, but, um, but typically it's solved from the beginning. That means when you and we decide to buy such a clock, we know that Apple has the data, and we are fully fine with that. So Apple has the data already, and the question is, what will the company do with the data? They will create a platform <coughs> where they First of all, try to manage healthy patients, maybe to have some lifestyle interventions in terms of food, in terms of how we uh, do sports, how we exercise, uh, how we maybe physically uh, interact, whatever. And at one certain point of time, they might become more interventional. And as a, let's say, um, in-between step, they will start um, steering or managing us, uh, managing us as uh, patients or as, as humans, so to say. So that is already happening. And, and uh, the problem here is that uh, the established providers typically have problems to use data they generate. And that is typically because they do not understand they have to, that they have to do it from the beginning correct. And Apple is doing it differently because they are consumer-centric and consumer-driven. And, and the hospital and other providers, they treat patients, but not in a way uh, that they treat patients as consumers. That's somehow different. Um, that's also, from my experiences with uh, hospitals, exactly the case. There is so much paperwork, and when we try to digitalize that processes and get more structured data out of that processes, people are not used to thinking that way. So, um, designing data sets that matter and make it easier to predict things or to analyze things, that is a huge paradigm shift in how we do healthcare today. And I think that people can learn it, but you will have to learn it whilst you're in your first education. I mean, we have to learn it afterwards, it's like that, okay. But a lot of medical students that undergo um, their education right now, or nurses, will need to know how that works and why structured data is essential, and how that helps me in the cycle when it comes back to me again, so I can work more easily, can aggregate data so it's meaningful to me in my profession. It's not always the same thing. like. Uh, um, like a, a specialist doesn't require the same aggregation as someone who is a generalist and just needs to uh, connect the dots and say, okay, you need to go to that specialist. So making more ma meaningful data means for me uh, that we can rise to a different level as well. But we need to train people on how to think that way. And that's always a thing with the paper and thing. And what I w wanted to say when it came to my mind as well was it's always PDF. And people are telling me, like, it would help me if I had the PDF already. If that was available, that would be so cool. So for people today, it's cool to have at least the information on paper, digital paper. So we need to get that shift done from accepting that as the very least thing that isn't available now, but going towards one step further, how will we define a process in which we will create that and use that later for ourselves? I just want to come back to the point of, yeah, we would just have to integrate the data. Uh, we have all that data. I'm actually not happy that Apple has that data. Uh, that's always a problem. I mean, I'm currently forced to give that data away to actually have that product. Uh, but I don't think that's necessary at all. And I also don't think that it helps doctors to get all that data. It's not interesting to the doctor, let's say, if a patient was at the Reaper barn the evening before. It's inter yeah, yeah. It's interesting in certain respects saying, well, I, I was in an environment that had certain things. It, the exact data that I went to that one shop is, is, is exactly certain risk. But that's what, where actually I can help because I can summarize that data towards a given objective and say, okay, I'm now with a doctor. 
what happened with all that data that I personally collected on my phone and only the necessary data gets submitted to the next person. Not all the data, that would kill a doctor as well if I have to sift through tons of data from my mobile phone. Yeah, that doesn't help any doctor. But getting the information, patient was in an environment with um, higher risk of infection yesterday evening. That could already help. <laughs> <Not> yeah. only, <laughs> <what>? <laughs> but I think that, that's a point where I as a data scientist also say, well, of course, more data. Uh, great, we work with Chinese people and Chinese institutions, they have data available that's not conceivable in Europe. Uh, and I'm happy that it isn't. Uh, that's the thing, I mean, they collect way too much data, I'm not happy about giving this data away. So there is a solution in between. I think we always cry for more data and we just have to integrate it and then it works. No, it won't. Uh, and if we are honest, we already know this. So I think we need something in between where I have on my phone locally some service that actually collects that data. I'm happy with that, but only gives the data away that's really necessary. Uh, so I think this is a solution to this problem that we have to aim for. Uh, everything else won't work in Europe. Can I disagree slightly? Um, because I think medicine can be very chaotic and sometimes that one thing that you didn't expect to be necessary or for that diagnosis is, for example, that thing that he was out at the Reeperbahn. But maybe even more so, um, uh, someone told me about EHEC. Um, there was uh, this epidemic uh, spread of E. coli bacteria, I think, uh, was it three years ago or more? 2011. Okay. Oh some more years ago <laughs> and that was so exciting because nobody could connect the dots and that one thing that you might have gotten out if you had data mining possibilities in that moment was um, that people had eaten those uh, sprouts that was the thing and that is something unnecessary details can become so important in med medicine because it's such a chaotic and complex system in the human being. And that would be something like how will we decide and differentiate what's, what's important and how we can steer different levels maybe of data access from one person if necessary. Or if we see like, okay, that pattern search didn't work. Yeah. I, think, I think that's a very interesting point. Um, so we talked about like AI can take over in diagnostics, in uh, therapy, in prognosis, Oliver also said, and then you just mentioned all the connection of big data. And so what do you think? Do you think like the healthcare system or the medical system, is it a field which is going to be, or which should be like driven in the first place by entrepreneurs in the future uh, rather than by uh, medical professionals? I'm Please. the wrong person to ask. I'm not an entrepreneur. I, I have a personal hope and wish for that. I mean, medicals or physicians or even nurses fail to adapt uh, economic um, ideas to their profession for a long time and management and project management um, capabilities. I think we were much too slow in, it, in thinking us through that concepts and to use them to the advantage of the patients because a good business case in healthcare is for me that the patient uh, value is increased and it doesn't necessarily come with higher costs over the long run. So that is something that I would have uh, wished for that um, physicians would have adapted. And then the other thing is um, going to entrepreneurs versus physicians. I would wish that there would be getting their expertise together and that more physicians become entrepreneurs of healthcare. Um, so they will put their special and um, chaotic experiences and associative um, capabilities in that process of creating new business models because I think they have some good gut feeling about what could make the change and that combined with experts from tech would be I think the most powerful combination. So we have about uh, nine minutes left and I would uh, take the chance to ask the audience, are there any questions so far? No? Okay. <laughs> Let me allow just to add something. Uh, the question was, uh, will, will drive doctors a change? I mean, typically it's not always the, let's call it experts that have some problem which then design the product. It's typically a combination of, of, of the, the doctor in, in that case, uh, a technician as you said, but also you need someone who has kind of business administration background uh, or strategic perspective and maybe someone who 
uh, as a kind of uh, user interface uh, perspective, so it's a team approach. And typically, and that is one something I observed, and um, currently when it comes to, to, um, uh, to more measures to just nurture our startup ecosystem, for example, the BIH in Berlin is doing that currently, uh, out of the Charité, they understand that the doctors might have ideas for solutions, but need more people around them to make out of make a business out of that. Yeah, and we need businesses because um, innovation, as we we can we can see a lot of examples for that. Innovation is driven by new businesses. And I um, would would like to add here in healthcare we have to have some rules. Yeah, it's not not only about making money. Okay, as I, there should be possibility of making profits out of that, but maybe there should be some limitations as well. Yeah? Um, yeah, so what would be your last statement today? We have uh, seven more minutes, so you have about one minute each. So when it comes to AI and doctors, what would you like to tell the audience to, as a take-home message? Well, f first of all, AI is always on the table or already on the table. It's there. We have to use it to create a better medicine. And uh, as we... Uh, have to implement it or to, to increase the degree that it's used, we have to take all the people involved on board. So that, that is not a um, an statement to, let's say, uh, do it too slightly, but again, if we don't take the people which are using the technology on board, there might be kind of negative reactions to that which then uh, creates a time um, uh, in, in which we could implement it. So it is there, uh, it will come, and we should do it, by the way, driven even in Germany, otherwise we will have some solutions from the very far east. Um, yeah, more about the data and will we ever replace a doctor that actually does an operation uh, by an automated machine, fully automated machine? I think um, currently we talk a lot about data and I think we will never get to the level of a doctor by just creating data sets and training on those. Uh, what we currently do and we see a large drive um, in neural networks currently is that the system has to explore the environment itself. So for many robots we actually let them learn. The Go player played against itself Go. Same for chess and we do it for robots. We put them in a simulated environment and let them explore, create their own data like a child would do. Uh, I, can ex I can definitely decide in this area of the environment, I don't know much yet, I go there out of curiosity and explore this. This is not possible in medicine in many cases. I can't let a machine uh, go to a patient and say, explore. Uh, you, we would need a lot of patients for this. Um, but that's exactly the problem. I think in medicine, the data can't be automatically generated like this, unbiased as it is. But maybe over decades of robots and doctors working together on the machine actually helping each other, the robot sometimes suggesting something that the doctor has to think about and vice versa. I think that could be the explorations, but that would take a long time, but could end up with a machine that actually can make intelligent decisions. Yeah, yeah so taking back with the, with the, with the points, um, I think AI, I mean, from, from my summary, AI will not replace doctors, <laughs> from my point of view. Uh, will help them to to uh, to have a better understanding, to have a better view of how to treat the, the patient. But uh, right now, and I think, uh, as you said, not in long long term time uh, now, will not replace the doctors, but will help. Will help absolutely. Um, just just to, to to mention, for example, for uh, for a radiologist, uh, really tired, uh, the whole day looking pictures, and and and, and AI could help in that time for for that period for that radiologist to identify some something that he missed, for example, because of the stress of the work or so. So right now, this kind of this uh, uh, we can we need to think that AI will help. And we need to also embrace uh, the technology in a sense that to how to understand that we are dealing with this kind of stuff in the future and now, and how to understand how this works, how, how we can do this technology uh, trusted and transparent in order to be like uh, 
yeah, to not, not get this kind of bias in some of the data and, and, and so on. So that is my, my point of view and yeah. Thank you for the statements. I think I can really relate to it. Um, my statement would be, do not erase medical professions via AI, or don't think you can actually do it. But um, think it as a support and a supportive structure for human touch in care processes, and use it to erase bullshit tasks for that medical professionals, bullshit methods. We all pursuing and we might not even know that they are wrong and not helpful and use it to inspire creative new research on how we can create the future medicine, not healthcare experiences this time, but essentially medical quality. So thank you very much. I'll just have a look on the watch. We have two minutes left, so I think we'd like to give a little sum up of this discussion round. I think all of you four are on the same page when thinking about that AI um, can be very, very helpful in doctors' daily life, in like doing monotonous uh, work that no one wants to do or no one likes to do, like paperwork. But um, maybe we should like um, look at AI, not like doctors versus AI, but um, like a symbiosis of both of them and uh, look at AI that um, AI can help us um, saving more time and spending more time on the human aspects of um, treatment. I think um, this is the summary of today. Um, so I can lean back a little bit and <laughs> maybe go to a sports class today. Um, is there any questions from the audience? Well, if no one else has a question, I probably should go away from the speaker. Um, my name is Avid. I'm in the field of biomedical engineering, and um, we always get told that we're the ones designing um, like the tools for the doctors. And um, talking about that, I don't know. Um, talking about AI, I'm well, willing to put in a thesis that uh, AI will also just be a tool for a doctor and it will never replace a doctor, it will always just stay a tool. Um, if you look at the FDI, uh, FDA just starting to um, have ways of, um, well, um, getting a certification for algorithms in devices, etc. You see the industry leaning to um, AI or, or algorithms also being just a tool. Um, how do you think we can um, work together with the doctors in um, yeah, creating those tools? Because I think that's uh, way more difficult than just going and, I don't know, having a new CT or MRT or something like that. Mm -hmm. Actually, your opinion interests me as much because I want to know how much in contact with physicians you already are in the creative process in designing your AI. That would be something that would interest me. From my perspective, it's getting together with them while they're in training to become doctors, not when they are in the stage of uh, establishing themselves and not uh, being at the helicopter perspective of, of what's possible, maybe. And my statement was not to um, not think of um, possibilities where a doctor would always need to be in place, but maybe certain tasks and certain things that we have r repeatedly in medicine can be replaced. I don't think the entire profession can be erased, but I think some tasks and some methods can be established vi via uh, an AI that would be above a tool perspective. So it's not just tooling, I don't know if what you associate with it, if it's a bit negative or a bit less that we would have expected, but it can be a bit more of a treatment perspective as well. So don't, don't hesitate to come to your doctors or developing doctors for that. I just want to agree on this tool perspective because saying it's just a tool, from a certain perspective, yes, but a tool we never had before. Uh, it's not like a hammer. It's not like something that I have to use and I'm in full control of. It's actually an interactive partner. If let's say in 10 years, I actually have a machine next to me that follows my operation and actually makes suggestions, maybe takes over certain tasks that can be taken over. That's not a tool as you would see today. 
Uh, that's definitely more than a standard tool, it's an intelligent tool. A tool nonetheless, but intelligent and something we didn't have yet. So it's definitely a different use and the doctors have to get used and will change because of that as well. I mean, the doctors will get used to it and maybe even change their own um, actions. will say, well, yeah, this part can be done by the machine much better than by me. I focus on parts that only I can do and can do much better. Uh, so there will be a sharing process, I think, between an intelligent tool and a doctor. Just to add one point, we talked about the team perspective. I think that's true here as well. Maybe a good combination would be a doctor with some experience, but being also a data scientist. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would be a very good thing to do, because uh, again, I think we, we will need, uh, on the basis of data, ask more questions and then found, find solutions. And every, as you said, I really like that statement, uh, everything is important. Because you don't know what is really important, so you have to collect everything and to make then out of that in kind of importance. Yeah? Well, actually, there's this one um, class in university. It's called bioinformatics. So um, we have that already. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well advanced. Um, somebody else? Hi. Yeah, thanks for a very interesting panel. One, uh, I remember a story that I actually witnessed myself in a supermarket at the cash register when the electronic cash register went, were introduced decades ago. Many young cashiers don't really know how to calculate change, how much change they should give you back. They just punch in the machine and they get a number. Yeah? And the display was malfunctioning, so somebody got the wrong change. And they try to convince the cashier, no, that's not correct. You know, you still owe me 20 cents. And the cashier would not, yeah, but the, ma the machine said, I only owe you that much, you know. So people essentially lost the skill once that operation was automated and they became to trust the machine. Now, if we automate certain things in the medical profession, like finding lesions in, 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 in CT scans, right, it could be that doctors lose that skill. They are not trained on that because we already have very good computer vision systems that recognize that. And it's just lost. It's a skill they lose. And when the machine says, no, that's OK, they look at it and say, well, the machine said it's OK. It's probably OK. You know? And that's scary to me. <laughs> I don't know, any, any thoughts about that? <laughs> so um, I just want to add one little thing to that. Back in the days, the young assistant doctors had to taste the urine of a patient to see if it's sweet, to diagnose diabetes. And they cannot do it anymore. <laughs> just saying. Okay. Okay. <laughs> they, they cannot do or not, or not allowed to do? I never did that. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, what you are describing is, let's call it, quite typical. If you have new technology, uh, we, we, we as mankind lose somehow the, the old experiences. Think of uh, Notre Dame, where it's going to be rebuilt. Everybody, everyone is thinking of, of uh, which craftsmen from all over Europe could maybe help on that. So that is the same uh, always. I, th I think um, we, sh we should try to conserve some knowledge. Maybe we need it sometime. But, but hopefully technology makes us uh, better in a certain way. But it changes, of course, processes, it, sh it changes behavior. And, and I would add, I think uh, as we are in a time where techno technological progress is very fast, I think the cycles are much faster. That is, that is an issue. Uh, so we're not talking about the steam engine uh, era, which, which took uh, 150 years. But we talk about an era that is maybe 10 or even, I don't know what, what kind of, 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 of duration, but it's very fast. totally agreeing that we will have to find methods on conserving knowledge. There is a water um, um, water energy station in Hamburg, uh, in a clear, clearance station that uh, collected um, water from the river Elbe to, to clear it and it has a complex mechanism uh, on how it works and we lost that knowledge um, from post-war to the 70s. Nobody could work with that water station. They 
uncovered it out of plants because it was not working anymore for a long time um, in recent years. And they tried to put that uh, mechanism in, in place again, and they couldn't because they completely lost the how-to. So conserving a how-to will be an essential capability, I think, for future development. And it is one of my biggest fears that we will lose the idea of we will need to be able to understand how it is done and doing it ourselves. Then if we lose that, we cannot creatively um, do uh, deal with the results that the AI delivers us because we are not capable of the pro imminent process. And then we will be quite blind and have to rediscover all our previous healthcare knowledge again and that will take us so much more time than, uh, that again or maybe as much as we uh, had to take in the beginning. So that's an essential crisis within that model. And I know how it is. You rely on that and you think, ah, oh, how easy that is. I don't think that many young people can navigate via a, a map, an actual map, through a city anymore. So, <laughs> one day we will have to explain how it was done back in the days, <laughs> in a museum, <laughs> offline. <laughs> yeah. Im Im imagine the failure of Google Maps. Oh my goodness, people would run around <laughs> crying. Crashing. <laughs> Crashing area. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that was just anecdotal. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, just an idea. Perhaps in 20 years, there will be sitting um, robot doctors and discussing do we still need human doctors as a tool, or do we not? <laughs> Just a final question. Yeah. Maybe you want to answer? Well, well, when we really think about medical technical progress, my observation would be that we have a kind of prevention system. So typically, we we don't need doctors because everything which could happen could be repaired in advance. That is one issue. Uh, if we would be too silly to have some, uh, let's say, called emergency from a uh, from a traumatological perspective, uh, then I think it will be fixed by robots. Well, I would say I'd, I always say when people say, "Well, once the robots are intelligent, they don't need us anymore." Um, I think if they are intelligent enough to sit here and talk about whether they still need us, they are intelligent enough to actually see why. As much as we discuss currently, uh, yeah, <laughs> well, I, I hope intelligent enough to see there is a reason uh, to keep us. Uh. No, but it's the same as we now discuss about, well, they might be useful despite many problems. Uh, they might also say, well, they are quite difficult to keep, but um, they have their uses. Uh, so if we reach that level of intelligence, well, then we can only hope. All right, then um, we will get to an end. It was, I think this was the last session, right? Yeah. So, yeah, this was the first um, 12 hours US conference so far. And uh, I hope you had a good time. And maybe we see you next year then. <laughs>